Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and my name is Dudley Connell, as you know, and I'm here to welcome you to the International Bluegrass Music Association's World of Bluegrass. It's an honor to stand before you today, and I'd like to thank Daniel Mullins for uh, inviting me in the first place. And I'm sure, as a lot of you know, most of you, Daniel comes from very good stock. And uh, like his dad, Joe, he's a stand-up guy, and with young men and women like him, I think it's comforting to know that our music is going to be, going to be left in very good hands. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, last year, 2020, as Mike said, I was honored to be inducted into the Bluegrass Music Hall of Fame, virtually, of course. Um, and, um, and it was for a band that I established in 1975 called the Johnson Mountain Boys. Well, thank you, thank you. That, uh, that, was, a, that was a great time, and uh, it's been a long time ago. But, you know, it's, it's, it's been a great ride all the way along, and, and thanks to you guys for being there and helping me out. I guess today what I want to talk about mostly is about the COVID-19 or the pandemic of 2020 now unfortunately stretching into 2021. I'd like to talk about the musicians, the promoters, the booking agencies, radio, and how they've all been affected in the pandemic and how they've managed to, you know, to make it through a year of not really doing much of anything, at least, you know, out, out and about. And uh, I'll start with musicians because I know a little bit more about them than those other folks I, I mentioned. <laughs> all right. Our lives changed in March of 2020. We watched our entire festival season collapse. Apart from a few isolated dates, um, I think the last regular date that I played with the scene was in March of 2020. And I remember when we were packing up our gear, Ron Stewart said, you know, I think this is probably the last date that we're going to play this year. And I, you know, I thought, well, maybe, but I thought he was exaggerating a little bit, but it turns out he really wasn't. It really was, it really was just about like that. I, I do want to tell you about one date that we did play. We played at this little venue in Annapolis, Maryland called the Ram's Head. And uh, it is, it's about a 350 seater, you know, something like that. Not as big as the Birch Beer, but a pretty nice theater. And what they decided to do was put up plexiglass across the front of the stage. But unfortunately for us, they didn't put it up straight across the stage. It was layered like so. And, and when, when we walked up on stage, it was, you kind of had the feeling like you were in a fun house or a house of, house of mirrors. Now look. I've played with this band a long time, and I know that this is where Lou Reed stands. He stands right here, but when I looked out at the audience, he was over here. It was just kind of kind of bizarre. It was kind of like a 20, 20, 21st century um, uh, chicken wire deal, you know, to keep the beer bottles from hitting the stage. But, you know, I mean, we adapt. You know, you do what you got to do. And uh, we were fortunate enough to hang on to what we had through the help of PPP loans, state unemployment, some stimulus checks, and other sources of revenue. Uh, many of us didn't, that didn't qualify for this type of assistance were, formed, were forced to find other ways of making a living for themselves and for their families. Unfortunately for our community, some just won't be back. You know, and I, and I'm, and I, and I hate to say this, but I can't deny it, there is something to be said for the stability of a year-round paycheck with benefits, sick leave, and retirement plans. That being said, I would never do anything else. But it, I do understand the plight of people that have lost their income, and they have, they have families to support, you know, just like the rest of us. Uh, more than one musician, including myself, grew accustomed to staying home, especially on weekends. In June or July of last year, I really thought that it might be time, you know. I mean, I've done this for over 40, 40 years now, and maybe it's time to let the music go and make room for others and to pursue some new adventures for myself and my family. Well, that lasted about as long as it took for me to get back up on stage, and I really realized how much I missed it and how much I needed it for myself. It's just like a part of who I am. And uh, we found our audiences in 2021 to be bigger and more enthusiastic than ever. They missed us just like we missed them. And um, you remember the old Joni Mitchell song, it was to see, I think it was called Big Yellow Taxi, and there was a line in there that said, you don't know what you got till it's gone. That's true. 
I'm here to tell you, you don't know what you got till it's gone. She was right. It helped me realize, too, that you can't take anything for granted. Anything can blow up and be gone overnight. Lesson learned. Embrace and cherish what you have, be it family and loved ones, or your, possession, or your profession, or both. Promoters. Although I'm not a promoter myself, I do archival work, as, the, as Mike said, part-time now for a nonprofit organization called the National Council for the Traditional Arts. The organization was founded in 1938 and produces the National, National Folk Festival, which travels around the different parts of the country and moves every three years in the hopes that when the festival moves on, the groundwork would have been laid for the town or city, wherever they held the festival, would continue it. They would realize its value and importance. And um, so this year was the first, last year, everything we did was, was um, everything we did was virtual. This year is the first year that we produced the National Folk Festival, which was held in Salisbury, Maryland, as a three-day event, however, scaled back a little bit, and uh, it was really well received, and, and um, they brought in people from all over the world to participate in this, musicians and, and, and participants and, and families. In addition to the National Folk Festival, which is, uh, by the way, free to the public, um, uh, we also produced the Lowell Folk Festival, which some people have said actually saved the town of Lowell. In, uh, in many ways, and it, they've really brought that city back. It's been a wonderful thing to see what's happened in Lowell. Another festival that we work with is the Richmond Folk Festival, but I'm not gonna tell you where that is. It's uh, perhaps too obvious, I guess. And uh, we also work with the uh, National Endowment for the Arts, National Heritage Fellowship Awards. All these festival stages are recorded, and they, and they have been since the early 1970s, and that's where I come in. I'm responsible for preserving the recordings and cataloging all the material, and that's my piece of that puzzle. Uh, to quote my friend Ron Thomason, I told you all that to tell you this. I spoke with our associate director, Blaine Wade, who's at the NCTA, and he shared with me that the toughest part of his job was the heartbreak of calling artists and canceling contracts, knowing full well the pain the groups were feeling financially, but also the, the, the being deprived of the group's creative energy and symbiotic relationships they derive from playing for audiences and, frankly, each other. I mean, we really do support each other. I mean, it's just, it's just something magic that happens. I can't explain it, really. Um, but, you know, this, the, the virtual stuff was also to offer audiences a, a chance to, for the bands to be up, to see the bands that they love, and also for the bands to reach out to their audience. Blaine also shared with me, though, and this is sort of sad, but he said that he couldn't do virtual himself again. He said that the new, the new smell had worn off, was his quote. And, it, and it's, they had to get back to live performance or the, or the agency would fall apart, even after, even after 80 years. So... Okay, one event that Sally and I participated in was to perform virtually. You know Sally, right? My wife, Sally? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, we did a virtual uh, concert for, uh, not a concert really, but we did something for Wintergrass, which was a virtual donor and board member event, including a meet and greet session. It was an effort to keep the donors involved and interested in keeping the festival series alive. The caring feed of donors is crucial, especially now. As, as shows begin to open up and we get back to live performance, every little step brings a new risk and challenges. And all the fine print details, from putting an artist on a shuttle to thinking about hotels and, and elevators in hotels. And being a longtime member of the IBMA and sometimes participant, we know all about elevators. Remember the Galt House? <laughs> well, with no disrespect to Owensboro, Louisville, or Nashville, I think this is the best home that we've had for the IBMA here in Raleigh. <laughs> Booking agencies. The seldom seen is represented by the Cumberland, Mountain, Cumberland Music Collective, which is an outgrowth of the Keith Case Agency that Keith actually founded in 1984. 
Keith retired in 2011 and unfortunately passed away at the age of 79 in 2019. Fortunately for the scene, with Keith's retirement, the torch was passed to our longtime personal agent, uh, Lee, Lee Olson, and he founded his own agency in 2019. We have worked with Lee the entire time that I've been in the band, and as hard as it is to believe, I'm not, I've now been a member of the seldom scene for 26 years. Yeah, crazy, huh? Anyway, uh, when John Duffy was still alive, he acted as the liaison between the band and Lee Olson. They mostly got along. John could be tough. I, I mean, he was a sweet, kind, and generous man, but when it came to negotiating, he's, he, 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 he was a bit of a bear, but he, but he was fair, you know, he was a good guy. And please excuse my language, but I have to share this story with you. John had a notepad that hung, over, hung on his bulletin board over his desk, and it was called John's Shit List. And, and when I, I, I took a peek at it one day, and when John had gone to the bathroom or something, I, I pulled it down, and I started flipping through it before he got back, and Lee Olson's name was probably the most frequently mentioned name. But there's a lot of people I didn't recognize, but the nice thing was Lee would be put on, he'd be struck off, he'd be put on, he'd be scratched out. And thankfully, Lee was in good standing, thereby not on the list when John passed away in December of 1996. But uh, I guess I'm talking about booking agencies. I, I believe I may have digressed just a touch, but I'll, I'll get back on target here. As I mentioned earlier, Lee started his own business with Keith's retirement in 2019. Then the pandemic hit. A business like Lee's depends on the ability of people to gather. Same thing with sound companies. You know, I mean, they don't have any place to run sound if people can't gather anywhere. So it's, it was really, it really tough. You know, Lee had hired two agents and a part-time staffer before the shutdown. By April of 2020, his artists had no dates, thereby Lee had no income. Thanks to his personal savings account, PPP money, and his social security, he was able to keep the, the staff on board until August of 2020 when he had to let everybody go. And actually closed his office and moved, moved to his home. And, uh, you know, he just had to let him go. And it's such a shame, you know, a fledgling organization like that just getting on the ground and they had to close their door. It's really, really tough. But f we're, we're glad because Lee was able to hang on. Many weren't so lucky. Many agents took the opportunity to form new companies. Some retired, others waiting, living off unemployment. For the, Cumb <laughs> I can't. For the Cumberland Music Collective, uh, Lee found grants, freely forgivable loans from the payroll protection program, a Music Cares and Shuttered Venues operating grant. These programs were crucial for his business to survive. Now that we're starting to get back, back to work, to quote Lee, vaccines are going to be crucial. They're going to be crucial for our business to come back. And it's crucial for us too. There we go. <laughs> you know, got to do it, buddy. It only hurts for a minute. <laughs> Radio. Radio, radio. For this segment, I reached out to my old friend and one-time bandmate in the group Longview, Joe Mullins. I've known Joe for 40 years. Joe now owns three radio stations, buying his first one in 1995. Many of you probably remember his dad, the great fiddle player, Paul Moon Mullins. His dad was also in the radio business. And I remember we were, Joe had booked us to play, I think it was in Wilmington, Ohio at the Roberts Center, and I flew into Chicago and I was driving by myself. And a lot of times when I drive by myself, I fiddle with the radio to try to find something that pleases me. And on this particular occasion, I was driving south, and, uh, and I think it was around Zanesville, I picked up a moon show, his radio show, with traditional country and, and bluegrass, and, uh, and he was doing a live advertisement for something called Columba, Cumberland Gap Bologna. And I swear, by the time I got to Williams, Williamton, I had a big old sandwich and, and a great big loaf of this bologna. And I don't eat bologna at home, but he sold it to me. He was, he was, a, he was a great salesman. It kind of takes you back to the, you know, almost to the baby chick days. I mean, he could really, he could sell, you know, he could sell anything. He was a wonderful man, and he did a lot for our industry, much as Joe and Daniel are doing today. 
Anyway, Joe was able to hang on to loyal longtime advertisers who helped where they could, and the ingenuity of Joe and his clients using tools such as curbside pickup and a lot of things that we were forced to do during the pandemic kept his advertisers in place, and Joe didn't have to lay off any of his staff. But I'm sure that he had to break the piggy bank a little bit just to keep people on, on, on staff and to not lose them. And you know something, that's, that goes back to what I said earlier. The old Mullins family, they're, they're stand-up people and we owe him a lot. It does, <laughs> it does take me down another rabbit hole though, and that's a topic that's gonna affect all our bottom lines, especially the musicians. With hard sales of CDs on the decline, and I guess we can also talk about Rounder Records a little bit here too, and, and all the record companies. But you know, how are we gonna get our music out to people? Much of the decline has to do with live streaming services such as Spotify, Pandora, Apple Music, and Amazon Prime Music. I mean, it's convenient, but, but you know. Anyway, uh, digital downloads have also affected all artists and put many record stores out of business. In fact, the only one I know in the Washington, D.C. area, where I'm from, is a place called Joe's Record Paradise on Georgia Avenue in Silver Spring. And Silver Spring is a sub suburban town that leans up against the uh, 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 north side of, uh, of uh, Washington, D.C. But if you ever get down our way and you need th that information, they've, they've really got a pretty good collection of stuff in there. Let's see. Okay. Uh, of interesting and positive note, many older people, like myself, who frequently would normally frequently buy uh, CDs from the band's record tables were forced to become techies during the shutdown, and many learned the ease and accessibility of downloading and streaming. This will affect an already d d declining CD market and probably speed its demise. It's not going to last forever. Neither will DVDs, probably. Another thing that I brought up with Joe, my musical brother, is that the majority of young people, they're not really that interested in creating libraries. And uh, I don't mean to generalize, I'm, and I apologize if I am, but I guess I am. You know, so, so much young people now, my children, 33 and, and 30, they're not interested in my record collection, or they're not interested in my hard covers of books. They, they download, put it on a, you know, an iPad or iPod, and, uh, and, go, and go down the road. Now, as a young man growing up, though, I, 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 I'm not to sound like a moldy fig, but there's something about holding a vinyl record and having the artwork in your lap. And, it's, and I feel the same way about books, you know? And, but, you know, I, but for me personally, you know, it's just, it's a personal preference. I just like the way they feel and like the way they look. But times do change, and yes, indeed, as hard as it is to admit, I have become an old moldy fig. Positive elements that have come from the pandemic. Considering that there were over 675,000 deaths due to the pandemic and climbing in our country alone, it feels a little insensitive of me to say that there were some positive elements that come out of the pandemic, but not to be a total Debbie Downer, I'll give it a shot and, and um, see what sticks, I guess. I think that the bluegrass community has proven itself to be nimble, resilient, and with a lot of hard work, developed the, the ability to pivot on a dime. It also seems to me like we've had to push a great big reset button in determining on what is important to us, family, music, you know, it's the, the, the money thing has been tamped down a little bit, I think. You know, it's funny, I, I, I do some of my archival work, well, I'm doing it all at my house now because it's all coming to me native digital. Where I, when I started, it was dats and cassettes and open reel-to-reel -reel tapes and things like that. But so I have a ground floor office that looks out onto the street and I see, I see uh, families with their kids riding bikes, walking dogs. I mean, it, it, and, and I guess this is true just about everywhere, but in the Washington, D.C. area where I live, you know, it could be an hour and a half to commute from where I live to, to work in downtown Washington. And by the time you get home from an hour and a half commute after working eight to ten hours, well, there, you don't want to do much of anything, you know? So this, the, the sh shutdown has kind of slowed things down and made people look at what is a bit more important. 
Uh, resetting values. By my opinion, the most thrilling, exciting thing to witness as a performer is when the audience turns itself into a community. I know that word's been used a lot tonight. It doesn't happen every time I get on stage, but it does happen enough to keep it exciting, gratifying, and fresh. Besides, what kind of job can you get that when you walk out on stage, you get applause? I mean, that's pretty damn special. You know, when I go to Whole Foods and buy an apple, they don't, they don't clap. They don't. And I like apples, so, you know, whatever. 2020 found us at a time when we had to refocus, reconnect, and reimagine ourselves as a group of people that all relied and needed each other. Many achieved this goal. Uh, many achieved this goal. Uh, we had to force the pivot. Many achieved this goal to become more tech savvy. I know some, some younger groups like Billy Strings have been very successful of that, with that. Me, not really, not so much, but uh, Sally and uh, David McLaughlin and Marshall Wilburn and I did uh, teach a vocal class for the Augusta Heritage Center at Davis Elkins College in Elkins, West Virginia, and we also contributed a song to the, uh, to the virtual concert. And that was fun, it really was, and I don't mean to you know, say nothing negative about it, but it's not like performing in front of a live audience. Almost done, folks. Today, despite all that we've gone through, we are coming back. I have found that the audience is to be larger and more enthusiastic than ever before. They missed us. We missed them. It drove home a point that nothing is absolute or guaranteed to last forever. No matter how much you love something, you can never take anything for granted. This pandemic proved that everything could be gone in an instant. It could go away. I don't think it will, but it could happen. In conclusion, so, so how's the bluegrass business going to redefine itself going forward? If we've learned anything this past year, it's that we, have the, we do possess and have the resilience and talent to adapt to a fast-changing landscape, especially when we work together as a community. Thanks a lot. Wow. <laughs> You guys are too kind. <laughs>